Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on LTE field testing, new challenges with noise limited LTE macro and small cell networks. I'm Kelly Hill, technology reporter with RCR Wireless News. I'm joined today by three industry experts on LTE field testing, and we'll be hearing their perspectives on trends and challenges in the market today. First, uh, we have Olga Yashkova Shapiro, Program Manager for Test and Measurement at Frost and Sullivan. Andy Standen, Product Manager with Enritzu. Amit Maholtra, Vice President of Marketing and Product Management for Azimuth Systems, also joins us. Um, we have a recently published report on LTE field testing, which is available on rcrwireless.com. Um, I'm the author of that report, and uh, some of the key takeaways from it are that layers of complexity are being added to various parts of the network leading to increased complexity in network testing um, as we move toward LTE networks and uh, maintaining legacy uh, systems. Interoperability is a key factor, but implementation holds challenges beyond the standards, and maintaining both LTE and legacy networks presents new challenges in training and need for simpler, more intuitive, portable test equipment. You can download this report from rcrwireless.com. And now I'd like to introduce Olga Yashikova Shapiro, and she will be giving us a presentation on, on LTE field test equipment. Olga? Thank you, Kelly. Um, hello, everyone. And um, in my portion of presentation, and Kelly, if we could move on to the next slide, that would be great. In this presentation, I would like to talk about the state of the LTE test equipment market, uh, talk about key market trends, uh, uh, move on to uh, market revenue forecast based on uh, um, Frost and Sullivan's latest research, and I will wrap up, wrap up with the conclusion. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, as we all know, global operators have embraced LT as the next big thing, and they have initiated LT trials and deployment activities. The LT network deployment has also been driving, uh, driven by increasing competition among leading equipment suppliers to develop efficient radio access networks, cell site implementation, and uh, um, LT base station products. I just wanted to briefly touch on the types of test equipment our latest research uh, looked into under the field of under the field or installation uh, um, and maintenance test equipment market umbrella. So it's uh, RF handheld instruments uh, for problem troubleshooting and the maintenance of wireless base station and repeaters, um, access networks, air interfaces, base station testers, drive testers, and network performance test equipment. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, lists the key market trends in the LTE field testing. They are intertechnology and intersystem interference uh, problem, uh, migration towards remote radio heads, infrastructure testing at new frequencies, um, moving towards lighter portable test equipment, and multiple input, multiple output antenna technology, or MIMO, and a standard. Let's briefly talk about uh, some of them. Intertechnology and intersystem interference is um, another challenge in LTE testing. However, one of the biggest problems that has always existed and became currently much more evident is the passive intermodulation. So this is where different systems at different frequencies interact with each other using antenna systems. And because the antenna system is not perfect, degradation can occur in the system at the connector's level or corrosion can take place. Uh, when, and when things of this sort happen, there is a possibility of intermodulation. Um, it has a detrimental effect on the throughput of LTE uh, systems if uh, um, passive intermodulation uh, happens in the uplink, uplink frequencies. So it reduces the capacity of a particular cell site. Another aspect is the migration towards remote uh, radio heads. Um, in traditional systems, the radio um, is uh, not exposed to the elements and it is located in the, ca uh, in the cabinet on the ground in uh, remote radio heads, uh, where the radio is right next to the antenna and it is exposed to the um, weather elements, the reliability is becoming an issue. So contractors and subcontractors want to do measurements remotely and um, over the air. 
Um, another trend is um, often LT is installed in the same location as uh, legacy systems. So we can find, find GSM, um, WCDMA, and also LTE uh, coexistent and often uh, using the same infrastructure. And as a result, there is an increasing demand for testing uh, if existing infrastructure is used for LTE at um, new frequencies. Another trend is that test equipment is becoming smaller and lighter with more features and capabilities built into it. Um, also running solutions and standard products, for example, such as um, JDSU, uh, for instance, uh, um, their handheld solution is supporting tablets and uh, Samsung Galaxy smartphones. Another example of this trend is uh, ASCOM's recent announcement of their 10th investigation product that is designed for testing with iPhone. So as you can see, this is a major trend in the LTE field testing industry today. MIMO. As uh, radio technology is evolving from single antenna to uh, MIMO communication systems, there is an increase in spectral efficiency created in a more complex system. This increase in, data, um, in higher data throughput rates and improved coverage requires more testing and uh, therefore increase, increases the need for um, more test equipment. In theory, one needs two receivers in the uh, test equipment to be able to decode the MIMO properly in the field application. However, if two receivers are added to test equipment, the price of test equipment is going up uh, significantly. So with uh, all service providers' uh, emphasis to reduce costs, um, such approach approach would simply not work. Anjitsu, for example, has a good technique uh, that can be used to monitor the health of a base station in, uh, um, in the field remo uh, remotely. And, also pi and the company also pioneered a technique where service providers can do measurements of MIMO signals by concentration on some of the control signals that are actually transmitted at the, time, um, at the same time as the traffic. Uh, standards. Um, the 3GPP um, family of uh, technical specification leads wireless uh, access networks all over the world. We all know that. And uh, service providers and NAMs must strive to meet the requirements of uh, um, this evolving standards, which promise to deliver better end user experiences that feature better user mobility, accessibility um, uh, across operators, higher data throughput rates and increased reliability. So carrier aggregation is one of such important tools that is crucial for uh, 4G to operate well. So the testing of such standards is imminent and that's why the demand for LTE test equipment is expected to continue rising. Therefore service providers and NIMS must continually acquire newer and better testing solutions to ensure that um, evolving technologies um, adhere to progressing standards. Moving on to the next slide. According to our latest research, the global LTE test equipment market generated 947.2 million in revenues in 2012 and is expected to exceed a 3.9 billion mark in 2019, um, growing with a compound annual growth rate of 22.7% from 2012 uh, to 2019. And this is significant growth that we are expecting for this market. If we look at the pie chart uh, to the right, um, uh, we can see that LTE installation and maintenance test equipment contributed only 8.8% in 2012 to the overall LTE test equipment market revenue. But by the end of um, the forecast period, by 2019, the segment uh, um, is expected to contribute significantly more, 18.4%. Um, as the demand for the LTE field test equipment will continue uh, to increase with more deployments. Moving on to the next slide. This slide represents the revenue forecast uh, for the installation and maintenance application segment of the LTE test equipment market. As we can see in 2012, the LTE field test segment um, uh, reached 83.4 million in revenue. However, by 2019, it is expected to contribute 731.9 million to the global uh, LT test equipment market uh, revenue. The CAGR of this market uh, from 2012 until 2019 is expected to be um, uh, about 36.4%. And uh, so 
it kind of illustrates that this market presents the great opportunities for test equipment vendors. While an increase in complexity of networks and their related equipment brings about a variety of challenges for field technicians, it also translates into better opportunities for test equipment vendors, and one such opportunity is conformance testing. While most conformance testing is conducted in a lab-controlled environment, devices might, must also be brought out into the field to ensure that communication equipment operates properly and that customers are receiving high-quality services. Another thing I wanted to emphasize is that uh, product integration has become an ongoing trend in the communications test equipment industry, um, as more and more features have been added to the testing solution. Uh, and because um, installation and maintenance sector um, uses hand handheld field instruments with integrated features for LTE, these instruments have become smarter, lighter, and smaller in physical size. However, extending the battery life of uh, um, um, the LTE handheld or portable testing solutions remains to be a challenge for test equipment vendors today. Moving on to the next slide. So to conclude my uh, portion of the presentation, um, the evolution of LTE technology is expected to create significant demand for field test equipment. And as LTE is also used in mission-critical markets such as healthcare, military, and public safety, um, additional demand is expected to come from the uh, from this vertical. Um, the need for light, portable, and easy-to-use test equipment is on the rise, as I mentioned earlier. And MIMO, intertechnology, and intersystem interference testing, as well as passive intermodulations, are the key trends in the LTE uh, field test equipment market. And the last one is a uh, uh, running test on smartphones and tablets is expected to continue going forward. This concludes my presentation. Back to you, Kelly. Okay. Thank you, Olga. And now we're going to hear from Andy Standen, Product Manager for Enritsu. Andy? Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. Um, I, I guess uh, first let me give a very brief introduction to Enritsu. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, we are a global test and measurement company specializing in communications and telecommunications test solutions. Uh, we've been around for over 40 years. Actually, in fact, uh, you can trace the origins back over a century. And we are a leading supplier of wireless, optical, telecom, and mobile solutions to cell phone manufacturers, chipset designers, infrastructure vendors, and specific to today's topic, topic, uh, a major supplier of equipment for field installation and maintenance of solar networks. So if you can move on to the next slide. Okay, um, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the key drivers in the mobile industry at the moment which are affecting network installation and maintenance and which have a significant impact on Amritsu's field test development strategy and it's interesting listening to Olga just now because she touched on very similar topics that I'll be talking about as well. The first issue is an insatiable requirement for capacity in the networks caused mainly by our desires for smartphones and to be constantly connected and have instant access to information anywhere and at any time and on the move and this puts inordinate strain on existing networks and stimulates the need to expand them or to roll out new networks and we're currently seeing various techniques to achieve this for example there are many new LTE licenses being awarded. And it might be interesting to note, despite all the publicity about LTE and the hype about LTE, and yes, it is the fastest developing mobile communication system technology ever, but it is still very much in its infancy on a global basis. Less than 2% of all mobile subscriptions in the world are LTE. So you can get an idea of the potential for further expansion. Another technique is to double up on sectorization at cell sites, so increasing the number of sectors from three to six, for example. 
this has the potential to double the capacity of a particular installation, but this may be offset somewhat by the possibility of increased interference. Uh, other techniques include the use of small cells, smart antenna systems, refarming of older 2G spectrum for 3G or 4G services, and specifically in LTE, as Olga mentioned, carrier aggregation, which can use more than one frequency band for delivery of content to a user. So all these techniques and others besides present certain challenges to Amritsu as a test and measurement supplier, not least to be agile enough to be ready with new methods and measurements when the demand hits. The second issue, Kelly, is the fact that many operators are running 2G, 3G and now 4G networks simultaneously to deliver services to subscribers and more often than not each technology is being co-cited to speed up rollout and to reduce costs and this does have some implications. If new infrastructure is to be installed on an existing tower there may be loading limits both weight and wind loading to consider since the design of the original tower never took into account further developments in the mobile industry. Now this effect can be somewhat mitigated by reusing some of the existing infrastructure but then you are relying on aging equipment to transport more complex signals to and from the antennas and with equipment that was never tested at the frequency it is now being expected to operate at. Now, in, in both those scenarios, the potential for inter-system interference is increased and significantly increased as capacity increases. And one such problem uh, that is becoming more of an issue in these types of installations is passive intermodulation or PIM, and I'll touch a little bit more on that later. The third issue uh, especially with LTE is the increasing tendency for operators to install remote radio head systems, sometimes called fiber to the antenna systems, where the radio units are installed very close to the antenna and data is fed to and from the radio via fiber uh, to a central control unit supplying many remote radio heads which can be hundreds of meters away. There are advantages. Uh, there's usually lower cost and there's lower power consumption, but on the other hand, the radio units themselves need to be super reliable since they will be constantly exposed to the environment, unlike conventional installations. Also, as Olga touched on, new propagation techniques are being employed, uh, such as MIMO, where multiple transmitters and antennas can be used to increase the throughput or improve the robustness of reception in bad signal condition scenarios such as may be experienced at the cell edges. Now MIMO was dabbled with in 3G systems but pretty much all LTE systems use some kind of MIMO 2x2 being the most common till now. So remote radio heads and MIMO pose an interesting challenge to uh, a test equipment manufacturer since remote radio heads are often installed at the top of towers or in inaccessible areas making direct connection to them virtually impossible. So Amritsu has developed some sophisticated over-the-air measurement techniques which enable field testing of remote radio heads without the need to connect directly to them and can also test the MIMO without the need to incorporate multiple receivers in the test equipment therefore keeping costs down. Now talking of costs, the next issue from an operator's point of view is is cost, but that ripples through to all uh, stakeholders, if I can use that word, in operation, and that includes Amritsu also. Installation and maintenance has traditionally been costly, but competitive pressures have meant operators are driving these costs down. Now, one way to do this is to de-skill the process as much as possible. Well, that impacts on us because we have to simplify the test equipment user interface and test processes as much as possible to eliminate potentially costly errors in the field. And Amritsu's primary objective when we set out to design a field tester is to 
as as far as we can make it automatically configurable and to implement a go no go testing philosophy and pretty much all of Amritsu's current field testers take this approach okay moving on the next issue is interference which is the number one enemy of the mobile network it can drastically affect the performance of the network and as a consequence the customer experience now for this uh, brief explanation I'll categorize interference in two parts the first part is interference generated within the network or interaction between networks and the second external to the network which can be either accidental or even malicious. The first type is a little more within the operator's control so we'll have a quick look at uh, those first. Now to improve capacity or coverage small cells can be overlaid in a macro cells footprint. In LTE this obviously has the potential to increase interference levels even though the standard allows for radio resource sharing between the macro and small cell. So that's one problem. Another major interference issue at the moment is passive intermodulation or PIM which I alluded to before and it's particularly problematic at co-sited installations and where infrastructure is shared although it can crop up anywhere and on any type of installation. So what is PIM? Well PIM appears as new frequencies created by the mixing of two or more signals in passive nonlinear devices such as loose or corroded RF connectors or rusty bolts to give uh, a couple of examples. When these unwanted signals fall inside the operator's uplink band they raise the system noise floor causing reduced coverage and increased drop calls. The impact of PIM on network performance increases as more frequency bands are combined on the common feed systems and also as wider bandwidth systems are deployed. Now in LTE networks PIM interference causes the system to use higher error, error protection and decreased modulation complexity from say 64 QAM down to QPSK which results in significantly lower data throughput. So it's it's a big issue, it's a big problem. And when you've discovered you have a PIM problem, you've then got to find the source. And Ritsu has pioneered a distance to PIM technique and its PIM analyzers, whereby the exact location of the PIM problem can be identified. The, the really fun ones are when the antenna system and the components within it are PIM free and the PIM source is external to the system and Amritsu can even identify external PIM sources saving much downtime and loss of revenue to the operator. Other external interference interferers not associated with the mobile system can still be problematic and Amritsu has some sophisticated interference mapping techniques built into many of its handheld devices where bearings of signals can be plotted onto on-screen maps and their location identified using triangulation techniques. And finally, uh, there is a growing trend for testing transmitters against regulatory requirements. That's both from a license condition point of view and for health and safety reasons. Different requirements for each, of course. So for licensing conditions, there may be a regular check of transmit frequency, bandwidth of transmission, and transmit power uh, as minimal uh, a set of tests for example. For health and safety of course it's somewhat different since the tests are designed to calculate the total RF exposure to us in areas where there is high population density such as shopping malls or schools or arenas. Probably it's slightly beyond the scope of this webinar but a rapidly growing area which Amritsu has a great interest in. So just to finish off um, on the next slide um, just to give you just a flavor of some of the types of equipment that Amritsu has in this, this arena. On the left hand side there, there is our latest BTS master which is a base station uh, tester 
which incorporates cable and antenna testing, spectrum analysis, interference analysis, and all the wireless measurements for 2G, 3G, and 4G systems. In the middle, a similar product, a spectrum analyzer based product without the cable antenna analyzer. And on the right hand side, there is our latest handheld portable battery operated PIM analyzer. In fact, it was the first on the market to have 2 by 40 watt test signals. And it's small and light enough to be able to carry up towers. So that gives you a, a flavor of where Amritsu is coming from and the challenges that we see in the um, uh, field testing of solar networks. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Andy, thank you. And next we have Amit, Amit Malhotra of Azimuth Systems. Amit? Hello, everybody. This is Amit Malhotra from Azimuth Systems. I'm delighted to join you today. And I also wanted to start off by saying that uh, I'm going to be providing a pretty different but complementary perspective on LTE field testing. Um, what uh, Olga and Andy have just talked about is um, LTE field testing at the network level. And uh, I'm going to introduce the topic of uh, uh, testing at the device level as well. If we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So um, it's our perspective, first of all, for those of you who may not be familiar with Azimuth, uh, we're a provider of mobile performance test solutions uh, in the lab and in the field for uh, tier one network operators around the globe, uh, device OEMs, chipset vendors, and infrastructure providers. And uh, we've been doing this for about 10 years now. We got our start in uh, channel emulation. So one of the things that we do extremely well is we actually emulate the network um, in the lab so that um, uh, devices can be tested against um, uh, external conditions. And uh, you know what our perspective on where um, you know the industry has come, uh, especially as it relates to the evolution LTE is that um, in the beginning of digital wireless, um, the drivers of the user experience were primarily uh, network-based. Um, uh, for those of you who can think back that far, uh, the first uh, retail stores of the um, major operators uh, were centered around one or two devices that all looked uh, similar, that uh, were these black candy bar phones that could do voice only. And therefore, um, much more of the uh, smarts of uh, driving the user experience resided in the network. That's obviously changed substantially, and particularly with the advent of LTE, um, not only the network, but now the device um, is a major driver of the user experience. In fact, uh, um, uh, it's commonly said that um, the uh, smartphones of today have more processing power than NASA had when it first sent a man to the moon. So it goes without saying that with the extraordinary amount of complexity that has been um, introduced at the device level, um, it becomes ever more important to test not just uh, the network, but uh, devices themselves. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, not just the device, but the uh, services and apps that reside on that device have also uh, um, um, established a, a new level of complexity. So um, uh, just within the last few years, our operator and OEM clients have seen a major trend where uh, whereas um, the device um, was tested extensively uh, between those ecosystem partners before it went into subscriber hands, um, it uh, then, uh, you know, remained uh, quite the same uh, during that, uh, you know, time in the subscribers' hands, and therefore, any issues that uh, arose are ones that could have been modeled during the testing phase. 
But what started to happen quite extensively is that uh, once the device um, comes into subscri subscriber hands, one of the first things they do is start to load it with apps over which the uh, the operator or the OEM have very little control. And uh, not only can those apps have an impact on the user experience, but they also have a significant impact on uh, the network itself. So there have been quite a few uh, stories about uh, networks actually being brought down because of uh, uh, apps that behave badly, cause signaling storms, etc. So the combination of um, network, device, and services and apps uh, that all combine to form the user experience um, and can have very um, strong impact on the reputation, the, the brand um, of um, operators, OEMs, etc. Um, <clears throat> those all now um, have resulted in um, an explosion in the scope of testing that needs to occur, not just um, before the uh, device um, is uh, launched in market, but um, oftentimes during its time in market, particularly if troubles arise that can sometimes be very localized to specific markets, there's a need to do a tremendous amount of uh, troubleshooting in the field and then um, backwards into the lab so that those troubles can be fixed. Um, so I've been talking about testing of devices, and this uh, um, testing occurs over a cycle, uh, which you see um, shown in the bottom of the slide, starting with R&D within uh, you know, chipset vendors uh, and, and OEMs, and then moving through to conformance, uh, which is mainly protocol testing and making sure that the device performs uh, as it's uh, um, to spec. But then moving into what's called performance testing, first in the lab of OEMs and operators, and then from the lab out in the field uh, where it's starting to be tested in real-world conditions. And um, during that phase, um, the testing is not simply about uh, whether it uh, um, performs the spec as far as protocols are concerned, but whether it meets um, performance benchmarks that uh, subscribers effect, uh, expect and that uh, will drive uh, subscriber satisfaction and whether the, um, um, you know, that, that particular device will be successful in the marketplace. So um, during that phase then uh, between lab and field, um, there's a different type of testing that uh, is based on um, benchmarking the device against um, either reference devices or competing devices in the marketplace to ensure that uh, it will, in fact, uh, be well received um, in the market. And then during production of the device and then all, uh, through post-launch, as I said, there's continuing uh, um, testing that occurs uh, either on the production lab um, or um, in the returns laboratory or out in the field if uh, there are troubles reported with a particular device uh, once it's in market. Um, so that's a whole set of challenges that uh, and, and layers, whether it's layers of uh, the user experience or it's layers of testing that need to occur. And with the um, the explosion of different types of tests that need to occur uh, at the device level. Um, all of these uh, ecosystem partners, from operators to OEMs to chipset vendors to infrastructure vendors, are all struggling to um, really contain the scope of tests, be able to model a rapidly evolving user experience, and all within a limited budget. So one of the keys um, is to go back to something that Olga mentioned, which is um, the need for streamlined, efficient um, test equipment. And I would say it's not simply test equipment, but it, it goes beyond that to include software as well. Um, because when 
um, your testing devices, the device itself can be the equipment, and it's the it's the test software on it that needs to be um, very efficient. And that's really where Azimuth has been focusing more recently. So if we can go to the next slide. Thanks very much. So um, let's let's take a look at um, LTE device end-to-end -end testing. Uh, one of the issues that that we have uh, found is that uh, test equipment between the different um, organizations, whether it's um, the the lab um, at a an operator, or it's the field uh, organization of the operator, or it's um, um, the operator and and the OEM, the test equipment, the test uh, um, the software, the test methodology, uh, and the results frameworks can all be very different because they're all investing in their own um, systems. And as a result, uh, when issues arise, it can take some time to come to agreement on uh, where the issue is and what the underlying causes are, um, what the severity is, um, you know, what's the best way to go about solving that, all of which can uh, drag out the process when uh, there's just increasing uh, pressure on time to market. So uh, one of the things that really needs to happen is for all these organizations to be able to adopt uh, common uh, tool sets and, uh, and um, uh, frameworks, which means that um, the uh, equipment or the software has to be able to work well in any of these environments, it has to be able to work well in the net uh, in the, the lab when there's an emulated network, and it has to be able to work well um, in the field when it's a live network. Um, the software uh, has to be able to collect and analyze results, and then to be able to um, um, aggregate and correlate the results, uh, pr produce. Uh, sophisticated reports that can then be shared across organizational boundaries. Uh, so what you're seeing here on this slide right now is um, uh, our methodology, which involves um, a test headquarters, which um, typically is in a lab um, within an operator, an OEM, and acts as the administrator for a test plan um, for a device, um, builds a single test plan that represents uh, the test cases which um, that operator, OEM, or so on, believes um, really um, uh, simulate the user experience. So it could involve uh, voice calling, um, web, uh, SMS, uh, video, et cetera. Um, building up those test cases, which then um, can be downloaded um, in test labs that are going to be testing devices um, in the, in field markets um, that are going to be testing the devices, and then all of those uh, labs and and uh, uh, field um, entities will use um, device testing. Um, software that will then automate uh, the, the uh, tests on the device um, based on that test plan that was downloaded, and then in the lab, um, run it through, um, run the devices through uh, network scenarios that involve emulated network um, in the field. Um, run those devices through those tests um, when they're interacting with the live network, and then. Um, analyze the results, um, be able to um, identify issues uh, where it looks like a device was performing under benchmarks, um, and then uh, be able to uh, isolate root causes. That information then is all uh, fed up back up to the test administrator in the, in the HQ, uh, feeding a database of all of the um, devices that have been tested over time, all of the test scenarios, and and one of the nice things about this methodology is if all the uh, test uh, cases 
uh, were uh, conducted consistently from one device to the next, then the results are eminently comparable, and therefore um, there's a lot of power in that database. And that database can then also be uh, shared across lab, field, ecosystem partners, and then it can also um, be used to generate uh, sophisticated management reports um, that can also be shared uh, across the organization. So that is um, that is a, um, a way to create a very robust um, uh, paradigm for LTE device testing as opposed to LTE network testing and uh, also uh, calls for um, a streamlining of uh, the the test equipment and software that's being used. If we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, and uh, we're going to need to, um, we, we do want to get to Q&A soon, so uh, go ahead, Amit. Okay, yeah, no, this is the closing slide. And so um, between all of these organizations then, um, uh, we create a very rich uh, device feedback loop. So. Uh, starting with um, um, a pre-launch before a device ever gets to market, but after it's been developed um, and is ready to go to market, um, using uh, device automation to drive test uh, automated testing uh, based on uh, network emulation, uh, such as uh, field playback or playback of actual field conditions in the emulated uh, network and um, uh, via uh, conducted or over-the-air um, environments. And then uh, that information uh, can be fed to the field um, organization during the pre-launch phase, which is then going to do the next level of testing out in the live network. And uh, um, then once the device is qualified, um, it's uh, uh, launched, and uh, there's post-launch testing that, that also occurs, including troubleshooting. And all of those learnings then are, um, are fed back into um, device R&D for the next generation of devices. So what, what are the uh, performance benchmarks of the current generation of devices? Because that sets the standard in terms of performance for the next set of devices. Uh, what were the issues, what needs to be improved, uh, and so on. So um, if, the, if the test equipment, software, methodology, and results frameworks all remain consistent throughout all these cycles, then that feedback loop can be very effective. So I'm going to now turn it back to Kelly uh, and start the Q&A. Great. All right, and we will start our Q&A now. Um, we already have had a couple of questions about whether the slides will be available and if the presentation and the recording will be available for later viewing. Um, everyone who has registered for this webcast, within about 24 hours in your inbox, you're going to get a link to the archived webinar um, as well as the presentation. Uh, so hopefully we've answered that question. Um, Olga, I wanted to come back uh, to you for our first um, question. And I'm wondering if you could, uh, you know, given all that we've uh, that we've heard today, if you can kind of give us a macro view about how the test equipment market is, or how is test equipment evolving? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, well, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, that test equipment is becoming more and more portable, lighter, and um, easier to use, in spite of the, all of the complex features and analytics that are built into it now. Um, Another thing is that coping up with the uh, evolving technologies um, in one device is becoming extremely important uh, for end users of test equipment. And there are a number of test equipment companies that are that are able to uh, to offer that. And um, another important trend is collecting test data in the cloud. So it is very important to hold on to the network intelligence uh, when uh, turning up and optimizing cell sites running solutions on smartphones and tablets, as I mentioned earlier. And also, I kind of wanted to um, um, 
uh, bring back to the um, azimuth systems, and uh, there is a trend towards end-to-end -to -end testing solutions. And uh, in my opinion, still the uh, azimuth field to lab um, solution is um, illustrating this trend. And that's when the company took the software that works well in the lab and modified it for use in the field in order to reduce the time and expense of testing. OK, great. Um, Andy, I wanted to ask you about um, common sources of interference and, and what are some of the common sources of interference that affect um, the performance of a mobile network? Well, the, there are many potential sources and I guess I've, I've talked a little bit about some of them, but um, I suppose you know, with with co-siting of, of systems, it's it's other wireless services which which uh, are one of the main causes of interference. We've also talked about PIM, uh, passive intermodulation, but also other types of intermodulation as well, caused by um, uh, non-linear active components uh, in the system, like amplifiers and uh, and things like that. Um, faulty or misconfigured repeaters um, which can um, cause interference, um, other spurious emissions. One of the common problems with PIM at the moment is where you've got in-building installations and, and things like lighting ballasts can react with, uh, with the mobile signals and produce intermodulation products which can cause problems in, in the uplink. Um, and on the uh, malicious side of things, I guess jammers. Sometimes uh, people don't want uh, people using mobile phones in certain areas, and they deliberately try and jam the signal. Uh, and then again, can be um, a, a, a common source of, of interference. So there's there's quite a few of them. A cable leakage is another one that uh, that could be a problem. Mm -hmm. But they all have the same effect on the network, and that is to basically reduce the performance and reduce the throughput and uh, reduce the customer experience. Okay. Um, we had a, an audience question about which equipment is better for interference hunting, a spectrum analyzer or a, or a monitoring receiver. Um, Andy, <laughs> is that one you can take? Yeah. Um, I might have answered this question differently a few years ago. Um, but um, uh, really, um, the thing with, with uh, uh, monitoring receivers in the past was, was they were pretty fast. Uh, and very often, interference signals are, are not continuous. They are intermittent. Um, they are you know, transient. And uh, monitoring receivers uh, in the past uh, were pretty fast. And the faster a unit it is, the, the, the more likely it is to, to capture it. Well, spectrum analyzers have caught up um, with that and in some cases um, overtaken the performance of the receiver. Um, and um, the other thing about spectrum analyzers is, is typically you can build in other options into it which can specifically identify uh, types of interferer and identify you know whether it's a an LTE network or a CDMA or whatever the interfering signal is, because you can decode it and identify uh, its its uh, signature, if you like. So, spectrum analyzers today are as good as monitoring receivers for capturing interference, but they are better at analyzing what that interference is, in my view. Okay. Um. Olga, uh, you know, one of the things that we kind of briefly touched on in a few different ways um, was this uh, this concept of the heterogeneous network and uh, and small cells and Wi-Fi. And I'm wondering how you see Wi-Fi and small cells influencing testing. Sure. Um, so uh, Wi-Fi and small cells are definitely influencing test equipment. You know, as customers prefer to cover multiple technologies in one device, such as 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, and as well, as well as testing the handoff. And uh, so if you are using the Wi-Fi to offload traffic, you have to make sure that the uh, customer experience is ma maintained, and uh, you have to make sure that offload is as good as um, 
as it could be. And uh, um, the industry is not quite sure what type of field testing is needed to test Wi-Fi. And at the moment, there is just um, uh, radio frequency RF power um, measures um, that um, are available. So, uh, you know, we did some research in, uh, at Frost and & Sullivan, and uh, the field test application for the global Wi-Fi test equipment market generated a little over 18 million in revenues last year. And um, so basically it's the smallest portion of the total market compared to R&D and QA and uh, manufacturing. Um, and mainly because the demand for Wi-Fi field test solution was minimal before 2011 um, as the Wi-Fi device could, uh, could be used to check its coverage. And mm -hmm. but with the recent uh, Wi-Fi offload trend penetrating the industry, the demand for Wi-Fi field test solution is expected to increase as a handover um, uh, begets a network management requirement. So um, small cells uh, also have a major impact on cost of testing as well as the um, skill of a field technician. You know, uh, small cells, especially in LT, have a tendency to uh, significantly improve capacity. So when small cells are used in conjunction with macro cells, there is a potential for higher levels of interference. So test equipment vendors have to respond to that requirement uh, to be um, able to measure that interference. Okay. Great. Um, I'm, I wanted to come back to you on something you mentioned on uh, field uh, test performance uh, measurements to meet subscriber side expectations. Um, you mentioned that uh, you know a carrier can put together a, a test uh, scenario that looks at voice, data, um, et cetera. Uh, video and other things, but I'm wondering, are there specific tests that are done on apps in the field? Are the maybe common ones, um, you know, that they expect a large number of subscribers to be using, or is or is app testing still mainly uh, the realm of uh, of the the test the app test the app uh, companies themselves? So um, there is an increase in um, operator testing of apps. And OEM testing of individual apps, and in fact, uh, what operators do now is to uh, track um, which apps are being used most heavily on the network, and then make sure that those apps are profiled um, on on the network. Um, because what can happen, for example, is uh, um, an app can uh, um, abuse the network in the sense of pinging it too many times, or um, um, really uh, um, requesting large video files, um, et cetera. So um, the operators, um, especially, and this becomes especially um, prevalent with LTE because now there is so much more bandwidth and there is so much more uh, platform for uh, rich media. So there are apps out there that are um, uh, taking advantage of that. Um, and um, that can happen quite uh, um, unfettered. That there's certainly a proliferation of apps, and um, you know, although the app stores are trying to implement controls on apps, um, uh, that's uh, not often possible until it's too late. So, the um, while I, I don't think that uh, the industry is ever going to get ahead of this problem, where um, the uh, um, um, apps are always going to be uh, tested before they actually get on devices and start to impact the user experience and the and the network. Um, the operators, OEMs, other industry participants are are definitely becoming more proactive in being able to head off issues. Um, as they will, um, like I said. Um, have lists of the most uh, popular um, apps. They will uh, monitor, you know, what what is happening with apps generally in the in the marketplace, and then make sure that uh, they're proactive in developing test plans and um, and uh, um, profiling the apps on the network, and uh, if necessary, actually working back with either the app developers or the um, the app stores to. Uh, Mitigate any issues that arise. Okay. Um, one one, uh, one interesting uh, um, offshoot of that activity is that 
the the operators and OEMs also then are trying to come up with industry standard applications um, that they can in fact uh, um, a model um, in advance because they have more control over them. So a good example of that is rich communication services. Uh, today a lot of what rich communication services are intended to do um, is done by um, over-the-top applications and so um, the industry is trying to introduce its own version so that uh, they can they can control not just the user experience or I should say the quality of the user experience but the impact that uh, is going to occur on the network. Mm -hmm. um, Andy, th that brings up an interesting question for you I think and that is um, you know this whole idea of preventative maintenance versus um, versus fixing something after it goes wrong. Um, so I'm wondering if you can give us some perspective on why you think operators should have one or the other. Um, well, I guess I would advocate the preventive maintenance approach <laughs> rather than fix after failure, of course. But uh, but actually, there, there's some sound business reasons why why it's a better approach. And uh, I perhaps I should explain that um, uh, one of the metrics that operators and carriers take very seriously is subscriber churn. Uh, which is a measure of basically of how many subscribers they lose. Um, usually these are publicly viewable figures and typical values range from say 1% to 2% or even higher and when you consider that these are monthly figures and you compound them over a year an operator can lose a quarter or more of his subscribers every year which of course he has to try to replace. Now there are many reasons why subscribers churn but our own study suggests that around 50% leave because of perceived poor network quality, experiences like drop calls or poor voice qualities, slow data throughput, poor coverage and so on. The problem with uh, a fix after failure approach is the network sometimes won't tell you something is wrong or degraded before it's too late and they've already lost their subscribers. Regular preventive maintenance on the other hand can show degradations over time before they start to impact the performance of the network significantly and corrective steps can be taken before they become a problem and very often the procedure can be done unobtrusively over the air without the need to take a side out of service. Now of course regular preventive maintenance has a cost associated with it, um, you know more technicians, more equipment but the benefit is a lower churn rate and the old adage that it costs six to seven times more to attract new customers than to keep existing ones is certainly true. So when you factor that in to the overall costs, preventive maintenance pays for itself very, very quickly and it's no coincidence that operators that take a regular maintenance approach have lower churn rates and reap the rewards accordingly. So that would be my recommendation and it's been proven to be the best approach. Okay. Olga, I'm going to come back to you for one last question, and that is, it seems like there's a common thread here that testing is becoming more complex, whether it's devices increasing in complexity, um, the network itself increasing in complexity, and I'm wondering if you can um, you know, give us some perspective on testing becoming more complex. Absolutely. Um, test equipment is definitely becoming more complex, and uh, the challenge for test equipment vendors is to make the testing as easy as possible. Um, since it is very expensive to maintain network, service providers uh, tend to de-skill their personnel um, as much as possible in order to save money. So that puts tremendous pressure on test equipment vendors because they would like to um, ensure that test equipment that they produ uh, that produce is very easy to use. So go no-go no testers um, without user interactions are in demand. Um, and uh, so making it as simple as possible with all the complexity is a big challenge for the test equipment vendors. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Again, we've had Olga Yeshkova Shapiro from Frost & Sullivan. I'm at Maholcha from Azimuth Systems and Andy Stanton from Enritsu.